Welcome, class, to Classics 160B1. Meet the Ancients! I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, uh, and today we are going to take a look at a very dark time, a very, very dark time. Uh, a time after the collapse of the Bronze Age, a time which we call, wait for it, the Greek Dark Ages. All right, so lecture 4.2, the Greek Dark Ages. Today we're going to tackle about 400 years of Greek history from the end of the Bronze Age, from that period of collapse that we talked about on Monday, all the way up until Greece really starts to rise along the trajectory that we end up um, kind of associating with the classical world. So let me go ahead and uh, make sure the right people are hosts here. There we go. Um, and Heather, kind of moving forward too, uh, if, if I kind of have started in on my thing, uh, I'm delegating uh, host responsibilities, if it's possible, to, uh, to Karen. So always feel free to just shoot her a, um, a, a message and she should have the ability to do that for you as well. Cool? Cool. Okay, anyway, the Greek Dark Ages, a very dark time. I know this is gonna be a scary lecture for a lot of people when society is collapsing and oh bad things are happening but first let's see what we got on the docket for today all right so we're going to start with a few announcements you guys know the deal there uh we are going to recap the collapse both in terms of what's happening and then some explanations for why it's happening then during the the bulk of kind of the original part of today's lecture we're going to do two things really one we're going to talk about the greek dark ages and really think about why we call them the Dark Ages, right? It's not like it's not like people woke up one day and they're like, oh man, this looks bad. Now we're in the Dark Ages. No, that's like a term that modern archaeologists and historians use uh, for particular periods of history. And we'll talk a little bit about whether that's an appropriate term and kind of why that term is given to the, uh, the period we're talking about today. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to start to see a little bit of a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, okay? And so even though for a long period of time things aren't looking that great, at least in terms of complexity, social complexity, what we get on the far side of things is something that had never been seen before in the Greek world. And so right when we come out of the Dark Ages, almost immediately we're given like the epics of Homer, right? The Iliad and the Odyssey. And so we're gonna ask some of these major questions that historians and philologists and archeologists and classicists have been asking for about 200 years about what's going on with that, why it's occurring and how it's occurring. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what we got in terms of announcements today. You guys know the deal. Put this thing in speaker view if you can. You can see me. You can see the slides. If you have any questions, go ahead and direct those uh, to your TA, and they should be able to answer them or funnel them to me. Um, the reading response uh, is due Friday, so make sure that you've started looking at that. You're going to be reading some excerpts of Homer. Um, and then also just kind of keep in the back of your mind uh, the research proposal. So we'll be talking a little bit more about the next step in that semester-long project on Friday. So start bringing a few potential ideas with you to class. And then actually what we're going to do in class is we're going to start, I think, kind of splitting these Friday sections. Last time it was 40 minutes on the project and 10 minutes for, for the honors project. We're going to do it a little bit more evenly. So uh, if you're not doing the honors thing, totally cool. You'll get out of here a little bit early. If you are doing the honors thing, you'll stick around for the whole class, and that's how, that's how we will approach that. All right, so let's go ahead and recap the collapse. When we left off last time, no, not when we left off, when we started last time, Bronze Age civilization was thriving, right? We got the Egyptians in the Nile River Valley. We got all sorts of different Mesopotamian cultures. We got the Minoan culture on the island of Crete and the Cycladic Islands. And we have the Mycenaean culture on the Greek mainland. And we call these like, you know, we call this the rise of civilization because things are getting very, very complex in terms of urbanization and monumental architecture 
and political hierarchies and religious hierarchies and technology and writing and all sorts of things that didn't exist prior to the emergence of these cultures. And that started right around 3000 BCE and then all right around the same time, from about 1200 to around 1100, things start falling apart all over the place, right? So this is what it looks like prior to that, back in the 14th century. Egypt's thriving, the Mycenaeans are thriving, uh, we got the Hittites thriving over here, all sorts of different kingdoms in the, the Mesopotamian region. And then during that 12th century, we end up seeing destruction at a lot of different sites, right? So a bunch of different Mycenaean sites, Minoan sites, Hittite sites, different sites in the Levant, sites in Mesopotamia, and then a bunch of battles in Egypt as well. And as we go through kind of the outcome of those battles, right, we see the Minoan palace at Knossos destroyed. We see the mighty citadel of Mycenae, right? This thing is legendary for its impregnable walls. It is burned to the ground. The Hittite capital at Hattusa, even though it's really far inland, this thing is sacked as well. And legendary Troy, right? The Greeks besieged this place for 10 years, according uh, to the Homeric epics. And even then, even then, Troy is destroyed twice during this period that we're looking at here. Now, Egypt doesn't get destroyed, but this does seem to usher in a period of political instability, what we'd call the Third Intermediate Period, shortly after the invasion of what Egypt calls the Sea Peoples. And we talked last time about how Ramses III, the, the, the pharaoh in charge of fighting this invasion off, he writes this big story, right, about how the Sea Peoples had defeated everybody else they'd come in contact with, but when they came to Egypt, they never stood a chance. Now, we see that maybe that's not quite true, even if Egypt did win, it did descend into political instability shortly afterwards. Um, but we do see that, that Egypt was able to, uh, to stave this off to some extent. But scholars right, have latched on to the idea of the Sea Peoples, of these kind of naval marauders, a group of diverse people from around the Mediterranean laying siege to well-established cities. And what we talked about, right, was that almost certainly this was a part of what was going on in the 12th century BCE. But as we've started to look at things a little bit more carefully, we've started to think that maybe this isn't the entire story that it leaves all sorts of questions kind of unanswered, right? Like, why are people leaving all at the same time to start this marauding, right? Why are well-established cities with massive fortifications like Mycenae, why are they unable to fend off like a kind of hodgepodge group of invaders? How is it that city-states really far inland, right? Like Hattusa, the capital of the Hitt Hittites, how is it that they're able to fall prey to whatever's going on during this period as well? And so what modern scholars have done over the past couple decades is start to look at a more complex picture of collapse. So we've got the invasion part down, but what they've started to look at are things like pollen, right? And what pollen can do is that can tell us about things like uh, agriculture, right? And the ability of these people to feed themselves, that sort of thing. So we'll, we'll touch on that in just a second. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the way that this cycle actually works here, right? Um, so with the Sea Peoples, the story would be that the Sea Peoples invade. And not only does this pose a physical threat to the people in the city, it causes systemic problems. And so what we're discussing here is something that we call like a systems theory of collapse. And so what happens, right, is the trade routes are disrupted. This means that city-states have a very difficult time obtaining tin, which if you remember is one of the core components, right, one of the two components that's used to make bronze. And when you don't have tin, you can't make bronze, you can't make your really effective weapons, you can't make your really effective tools, and that makes you more vulnerable to invasion, which leads to more invasions. And we can see here this vicious cycle of collapse beginning. 
And then what we talked about, right, is going back to this idea of pollen here, a bunch of other things that were happening. During this century, the kind of frequency of volcanic in earth, uh, volcanic eruptions and subsequent earthquakes was more prevalent in the pre that, that like during this set of 100 years than any time during the past two millennia. And then when we look at these tiny little seeds and evidence of pollen and things like that, we can see that it was um, very, you know, a, a very difficult time uh, in terms of agricultural production leading to famine within cities. And when we start to think about how these things are connected, right, we can see that climate worsening leads to drought, right, which leads to weakened city states, which leads to internal rebellions, which leads to people setting off, right? One of the reasons they may have set off in the first place is because of drought and famine and invasions. You throw in some math massive earthquakes and you start to get a sense for how it's possible that such a diverse group uh, of powerful city-states was able to collapse right around the same time. And again, if you, um, if you haven't had the, or if you're into this sort of thing, right, and you want to read kind of a, a good book that brings in both the sophisticated academic aspects of this kind of story, but also tells it in a very engaging sort of way, this is a great new one, 1177 BC, the year civilization uh, collapsed. And it really dives into this kind of systems theory of, um, of uh, Bronze Age collapse during the 12th century BC. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is start talking about the subsequent period. And this is period is traditionally known as the Greek Dark Ages. Now, again, when we say the Greek Dark Ages, right, or even when we say the medieval dark ages, right? This is not a period of time that, like, th th this isn't an ancient term, right? It's not like the Greeks living at this period of time started referring to themselves as living in the dark ages. Rather, this is a, a term that modern historians and archeologists apply to this period of the ancient world. And very, very recently, um, over the past maybe 10 or 20 years, scholars have really started to ask whether this is an applicable term, right? It's very pejorative and kind of meaning that it, it doesn't make the people who lived then sound very good, right? It makes them sound rather unsophisticated. Um, and so think about this for a second, right? Let's imagine that one of the main changes was that people stopped living in stone houses and they start living in wooden houses. How is that going to look from the perspective of an archaeologist? Well, for one, it's just a lot easier to find stone remains in the archaeological record. Wood decays, right? Uh, and so this isn't necessarily exactly one of the characteristics of the Dark Ages, but I want you to think about that as an example and why people have started asking this question are we really in a time of reduced complexity? Or is it perhaps cultural changes that make these kind of cultures and civilizations a little bit less easy to identify in the archeological record? So kind of have that floating around in your mind. And now that you do, I'm gonna argue that it actually was a period of pretty reduced complexity. <laughs> so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the um, some of the characteristics uh, of the this period of time, right, from around 1200 uh, to around 800. So first of all, we see the palatial um, cultures of the Bronze Age disappear, right? So the Minoan Palace at Knossos, no more Minoan palaces. The Mycenaean Palace at Mycenae no more Mycenaean palaces, right? And what we're kind of imagining along with this, right? One of the implications of no longer having these palatial structures is that the economy changes as well. So rather than having this sort of redistributive economy, which we talked about, right? Where people send goods to the palace and then the palace redistributes goods 
two different groups of people, right? Instead, we have much more localized economic networks. Okay, so Mycenaean and Minoan culture disappear. Monumental architecture disappears, right? So what you're looking at here, right? If you, you this should look semi-familiar, right? We spent some time talking about the Minoan palaces, especially the one at Knossos. And this is that aerial view, right? Kind of the architectural plan. And you can kind of see why they associate it with the labyrinth. Uh, so this dates from around, say around 1900 to around 1200-ish, okay? And then what's on the right is the biggest structure from the Dark Ages. So a period of about 400 years from about 1200 to about 800. This is as big as it gets. It's a burial. Okay, so it's a, a burial with a cover over it. Um, so yeah, what we're looking at here is not particularly complex compared to what we're looking at during the Dark Ages. All right, but that's all about big stuff, right? That's about the big architecture there. But when we look at settlements, when we do find the places that people are living, um, we see that the size of, the average size of a settlement is reduced. So you can think about that in a couple different ways. If you drew up a line around the outside of the settlement, right, wherever the city walls are, that could give you an average size. You do that in the two periods, much, much bigger in the Bronze Age. You can kind of count up the number of houses, something like that. Much, much greater in the Bronze Age. Any way you slice it, the settlement sizes during the Bronze Age are much, much larger. And somebody asked a question in the chat, right? Like, well, if they, what if they did live in wooden houses? We don't really think that's the case for the, the Dark Ages here because the houses we do get are still primarily made of stone. But archaeologists have gotten pretty good at identifying these things. And what you're able to do, the way that you find a wooden house, and this happens very frequently actually in Britain during the Iron Age, um, is you look for not the actual walls or the actual remains of the house itself, not the actual structure, but rather the imprint that it made on the land. And so what you actually end up finding are post holes because they were dug into a certain type of soil and then the house existed for a certain amount of time. And then when the house decayed and the wood decayed, it got filled in with a different type of soil. And so you can frequently find these if you do a good job excavating and you clear off a level. What you can end up seeing are these circles that have a different consistency of soil and a different kind of color of soil, that sort of thing. And then you excavate those and you can get the outline of what the house would have looked like. So that's not exactly what's going on with the Bronze Age and the Dark Age um, in Greece, but that's how an archaeologist would approach that sort of question. Now, it doesn't totally fix the, uh, the potential problem, though, because even though archaeologists have the ability to do that, I mean, think about it. That's still, that's still a heck of a lot more difficult than finding, like, nice stone foundation walls for a house. Okay, so settlements get smaller. Not only does each settlement get smaller, right? And somebody's right on time with the question, are populations getting smaller? We think the answer is yes, absolutely, because not only are settlements getting smaller, but we're getting fewer of them, okay? So you can imagine a scenario where population doesn't change, where the settlements get smaller, but you get a lot more of them, right? Same number of people living in a greater number of, of small sites. But that doesn't seem to be the case. This is a little bit difficult to see. This is from an academic journal. I don't, what a, it's not a very good map, all right? To be honest, there are better ways of designing these maps. But on the left, you're getting the, like each dot represents a site we know about from the Bronze Age in Greece. And on the right, what you're looking at is a map of, um, of sites that we know about from the Dark Ages in Greece. In any way you slice it, even if you count, account for the different number of the different like amount of time period for each of these, the number of settlements for the Bronze Age are just much greater. All right? So settlements are getting smaller, 
we're also getting fewer of them. Now, one of the implications of this, right? No palaces, smaller settlements, more dispersed settlements, is that we no long we, we kind of think there's no longer a, a centralized government that's controlling things. And I talked about this with regard to the economy, right? Where when we looked at the Bronze Age model, it's farms that a palace controls and that people send the goods to the palace and then things are redistributed. And what we think about is for the Dark Ages, it's more happening, either farms are becoming self-sufficient or very small communities are working together to exchange goods. But no longer is there a central government that's controlling things. And this is an interesting kind of question. You know, one of the bullet points I have on here is that, that one of the things this implies is a reduction in terms of hierarchy. And this is kind of an interesting question. I, I don't have an answer to the question, right? But like one of the things that frequently happens is when states get larger, you get greater stratification or hierarchy and higher levels of inequality. And most people, I don't know if most, people would frequently argue that inequality or high levels of inequality is not a particularly good thing to have. And what we see here is that we think that inequality actually diminishes, hierarchy diminishes as we lose centralized government during the Dark Ages and house sizes become a little bit more similar, settlement sizes become more similar, smaller. Um, and you would imagine a concurrent reduction in inequality. And so one of the questions for you guys, right? And again, there's not a, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this, but whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, right? Would you trade a reduction in terms of maybe the total amount of stuff in a culture or the sophistication of like kind of the major monuments of a culture, uh, the, the economic benefits of some sort of redistributive system? Would you trade that, right, for reduced hierarchy and lower levels of inequality? So interesting, um, interesting question. And again, one that, that I don't have an answer to, but uh, it's, it's an interesting one to think about. All right, so one of the other things is we have graves, right? We have cemeteries from both of these periods. And what we end up seeing is that things get a lot poorer during the Dark Ages. So when we're digging up Bronze Age, you know, graves. This is the Mask of Agamemnon, of course, from Mycenae. Um, and, you know, it's one of several golden masks. But even when you move away from the really, really elite burials, the sheer number of grave goods and the sophistication of the things included in those graves is much greater during the Bronze Age than it is during the Dark Ages. And so, again, if you look at it on a per capita level, right, just the average amount of stuff in each grave from each period, things get a little bit worse in the Dark Ages. Pottery changes, right? And you could say this could just be stylistic, right? But you could also make the argument that people are actually losing some of the sophisticated uh, technology or styles um, from the Bronze Age. So one of the things that's very frequent in the Bronze Age are these kind of like floral and faunal motifs. So you remember bull's heads from Crete, right? This is a very popular one as well from Mycenae. Uh, octopuses on the vases, right? But iconography, they're painting things on there that we can recognize as like people and animals and things along those lines. When we move to the Dark Ages, we have a whole new style of pottery that we call proto-geometric. You don't need to remember that term exactly. But we'll see geometric pottery later, and that's actually pretty darn cool. But Dark Age pottery, I don't know. It's not the most exciting thing in the world, okay? So again, you can argue that, hey, that's just a stylistic choice, right? That doesn't say anything about the sophistication of a culture. You could argue otherwise as well, that you really are losing some ability to produce um, kind of more complex styles of iconography. 
Long distance trade diminishes. Okay, so this is a big one, right? We talked about this with the Bronze Age collapse and how these invaders break down trade networks and people have tough times obtaining tin and making bronze. The same thing kind of happens for the next 400 years. After the breakdown of those trade networks, it doesn't really get going again until around 800 BC, right? So for 400 years, those long distance trade networks are not maybe 100%, but they're very significantly reduced. So as an example, one of the cool things that you get during the Bronze Age is you get a heavy influence of Egyptian material culture in the Greek world. So you can go excavate a site in Greece or on Crete and you can find like Egyptian things, right? Uh, so this is an example of a little uh, scarab seal. So this is something, you know, you, you put that into clay or wax to seal something um, with kind of the, the mark there. Uh, but it looks like a little scarab beetle, very clearly from Egypt. And what ends up happening is when you move to the Dark Age and you look at the material remains of those sites, all of it comes from a very, very small radius, right? Maybe you're trading with the village next door. Or maybe you have one thing that comes from kind of the slightly larger city-state 100 miles away. But there's much, much less in terms of imported goods than there was during the Bronze Age. Okay. And this is a big one here. Writing disappears! Right? So... For the Bronze Age, starting around 1900, 1800 BC, we've got this like linear A and linear B writing. People are writing things down. There's not, obviously, literacy rates are very, very low. It's a specialized group of people who know how to write and who know how to read. But people know how to do it. And they're using this for all sorts of different things, especially when it comes to record keeping. And then somewhere around 1200, during that 12th century, people forget how to write. And for 400 years, there is no more writing in Greece. And this is kind of wild here. So think about this for a second, right? Um, anybody, can anybody give me an explanation for how or why this might happen? Like, how does a culture just forget how to write for 400 years. So think about that for a second. Feel free to throw some things in the uh, the chat there, right? I'll give you a minute or two. Actually, I don't know if I have a Heracles slide in this one. So throw some things in the chat. I'm gonna go figure out, I'm gonna figure out for myself what color Heracles is today. Um, and uh, then we will pick it up again in like hmm, 60 to 90 seconds.
All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at a couple uh, examples here. So survival was top priority. Yeah, you could imagine that like if you're just trying to not get killed by sea peoples, you'd be like, the writing would be kind of low on your list. Um, lack of resources, that's certainly possible. One of the, the things that we're getting a lot here, right, a smaller population could make it more difficult to transfer that uh, knowledge over time. So that's possible. One of the things that we're getting a lot here is um, it has to do with what writing's used for, right? So if what you're doing is you're using writing in a palace to record what people are sending to the palace and what's going out from the palace to other places, well, when you don't have palaces anymore, you don't really have a need for writing anymore. So it kind of goes hand in hand, right? The uh, type of thing that writing is used for is necessary for the preservation of writing itself. So a lot, quite a few people picked up on that. I, and all those other things are true as well, right? <laughs> like writing really is towards the bottom of your list of priorities when you're trying to defend yourself. Um, but also it goes along with the... Um, uh, the kind of thing that writing is used for. And what we're going to see a little bit later today is that when writing comes back, it is totally different. Okay, so let's go ahead, uh, do attendance, jump over to D2L, quiz seven, yellow is the answer for today. I will give you guys 60 seconds to do that, and then we are moving into a wild new world. Uh, well, actually, we're, I guess it's not that wild. We're going to stick in the dark ages for a little bit, and then we'll move into the new world. Dr. Rob, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. Hey, Karen. By any chance, did you enable the Zoom meeting for you to become the host automatically when you log in? I, you know what? I, I yeah, don't that know. Is, that, that is happening. I know I was making you the host at the beginning, but then when you told me I could remake the host, I stopped doing that, but it's happening automatically now. And so... I'll look at it. I haven't changed anything uh, yeah, on I'm there. Yeah, not either. So, yeah, but just letting you know, that is what's going on. That's why I didn't make Heather, you know, like a co-host because I cannot do that as a co-host. Here's what I'll do. Um, I think from now on, what I'll do is just when I log on, first thing, uh, like first thing I'll do is just make you the host. Um, and yes, I don't have any problem as you told me, like just being the host for the class, but that is happening automatically. I'm yeah, because co hosts can't create new co hosts, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to let you know that I was not the one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 you're doing an awesome job. I I I don't understand why sometimes I'm the the host and sometimes I'm not. I I kind of thought it was like maybe the first of the co hosts to like sign in, that person would become the official host, but who knows? Anyway, I'll, I'll like keep that as a thing to, to do uh, first things first. Okay, so I have painted a pretty grim picture of um, what's been going on in the Dark Ages. And what I'd like to do now is go back to that one little burial, right, that we saw at the beginning. Remember when I compared the, uh, the Minoan Palace to the largest structure from Dark Age Greece? We're going to take a look at that largest structure, uh, and this is known as the heroon. That's how you say this word. The little, like, uh, the dots above the O mean you pronounce it as two syllables, right? So instead of haroon, it's like heroon. And basically what this is a fancy word for, right, is like the hero's tomb, a, he a heroic tomb of left Candy, and it dates to just after 1000 BC. Now what you're looking at here, right, is a map of Greece and... I'm just going to keep showing this to you, maybe not this exact one, but Greek maps again and again and again, because it's a complicated place. There are islands everywhere, there are peninsulas everywhere. Um, a couple things that you're going to want to kind of keep in mind, this peninsula right here is known as Attica, and that's where Athens is. The giant blob to the southwest here is known as the Peloponnese. And that's where Sparta is. And then up here, there's a little kind of island or peninsula, depending on whether it was connected or not at the time, known as Euboea in ancient Greek, or Evia now. And this is where the site of Left Candy is, 
right? So a little bit away from what's been going on in Athens. And then this region right in here, known as the Argolid part of the Peloponnese, that was one of the most like kind of um, intensely populated areas during the Bronze Age. So a little bit further away from that. And what we end up seeing uh, is this kind of heroic burial. And they think it's the burial of like a prince or a warrior or something along those lines uh, because he's buried with quite a lot of militaristic items. He's even buried with horses along with him. The horses actually look like they've been like driven into the tomb, right? So they like fell head first in there. It's kind of sad actually. Um, but this thing's about a hundred feet long, uh, this kind of apsidal building. And so you can see a recreation of what this thing would have looked like in the 3D recreation over here. And again, we're talking about something that's really reduced in terms of scale and complexity from what came before it in the Bronze Age. And this is a picture of what the, uh, what the thing looks like today. So again, a far cry from Knossos or Mycenae. But when we look inside of it, we start to get some things that are showing that trade isn't completely dead, right? Sophistication in terms of art and jewelry and things like that, ceramics, isn't completely lost. So you get this really cool, like, ceramic centaur dude over here, right? So again, the iconography is still there in some form. You get a relatively rich burial, uh, both with weapons and armor. You get gold jewelry in the burial as well. And some of the cool things here is that some of it appears to be heirloom jewelry. A lot of the pottery we know comes from right around 1000 BC, shortly after that. But some of the jewelry items come from hundreds of years before that. So some sort of heirloom in the family that they've been preserving uh, for quite a long time. And then it looks like you get some imported goods as well. So again, trade networks have largely broken down, but they haven't completely broken down. So left candy, right? If you remember kind of one site from the Greek Dark Ages, uh, left candy would be the site that still shows some traces of uh, kind of the previous economic connections and sophistication of the Bronze Age. But this is important as well because it's kind of heroes like this um, that many scholars think become the inspiration for Homer when he's writing the Iliad and the Odyssey. And that's what we're going to take a look at now. All right? So we're going to encounter a series of questions here known as the Homeric questions. Now, around 800, things begin to change again. And we're going to start talking about this on Monday next week. But the population starts growing. Art gets sophisticated. People leave mainland Greece and go set up colonies all over the place. The Olympics begin. Lots of different things begin. All right. It's a period we call the 8th century Renaissance. But one of the other things that ends up happening here, right around 800, is that the Greeks kind of reinvent writing. And when I say invent, I don't... It's not like they just created it out of their brain with, like, no predecessor. What they're doing, all the studies have shown, and we'll talk again more about this as we move forward, they're basically adapting the Phoenician alphabet. So from the east over here, they're adapting that to their own uses. But the alphabet's very different than what came before it in the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age was syllabic, meaning that each symbol stands for a syllable. And there are hundreds of those, if not thousands. But with the alphabet, all of a sudden, with 24 letters, right, consonants and vowels, you can make almost any sound that like humans can make, right? You put them together in different ways and you can recombine them in not an infinite number of ways, but in an almost infinite number of ways to recreate sounds. And what we get when writing comes back is totally different than what we had in the Bronze Age. All of a sudden, it's poetry in stories, right? And our earliest piece of writing comes on this cup right here. They call it the Cup of Nestor. It's an allusion to something in the Iliad. And uh, 
It's an allusion to the Homeric epics. So the, the inscription says, Nestor's cup, good to drink from. Whoever drinks from this cup, straight away the desire of beautiful crowned Aphrodite will seize him. And so it's kind of a joke because in the Iliad, Nestor's cup is this giant golden goblet that you need two hands to drink from. And this is like a little piece of painted pottery. Um, so it's kind of making fun of itself there. But already it's an allusion to the Iliad. And we think that it's around this time in the 700s BC, around, like in the 8th century BC, that we get kind of the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, somewhat solidified. So the Iliad and the Odyssey supposedly composed sometime around the 8th century BC, and later Greeks attribute this to somebody named Homer. And to later Greeks, Homer was this blind bard, right? He was this like kind of blind poet composing these epic poems. Now, when we look at the um, Iliad and the Odyssey and we think about Homer, there are a few questions that come to mind that scholars have been dealing with more or less since the discipline of classics began. Because when it began, the Iliad and the Odyssey were like at the center of the whole thing. And there were major questions that people needed to answer. One was like, was Homer a real dude? When I say this was composed around the 8th century, we don't have any texts about it. We don't have any actual texts from it from the 8th century. Like, this was first written down, like, hundreds of years after that. 200 years after that. That's the earliest actual text that we have of the thing. Uh, so, they want to know, was Homer actually a real guy? Right? If not, like, who did write the Iliad and the Odyssey? Did the Trojan War, right, the core of this sort of thing, did it actually happen? And were these texts, were they sung, were they written? What's the deal with that? Um, and if they were written down, right, like, who did that? Was it, like, one guy? Was it many people? Is it, like, a combined stories of a lot of different people? Um, that sort of thing. So these are some of the core questions that early people in classics dealt with. And we'll go through the, these kind of one by one and start to get a sense for how people address these. So Trojan War, was it real? Brief answer, we don't know. <laughs> so uh, Heinrich Schliemann, the same guy who excavated that mask of Agamemnon at Mycenae, he's also the guy who discovered the site of Troy. So we do know that Troy was actually a real place. But just because it's a real place doesn't mean that we had a Trojan War that occurred uh, in the manner that it's portrayed in the Iliad. What we do know is that there are a couple of destruction layers that correspond with the kind of end of the Bronze Age. So there are two destruction layers during that time that if there were a Trojan War that Homer was writing about, he's probably recalling the destruction of those layers. So again, uh, we don't have enough evidence to conclusively say, yes, a group of diverse Greeks besieged Troy in 1175. What we can say is that Troy was destroyed around 1175, uh, but we don't have the details to go along with it. All right, now, what about Homer? Is there a real Homer in the way that like we think about it, like some guy writing this stuff down? couple options here. One, there actually is like a real, a single real person. Uh, another option is that this could be a name for like a group of people who went around telling these stories. Uh, the third option is that it could just be a, um, you know, kind of a mythical person that was created later to give some sort of attribution to the epics that had descended orally through history. And once again, we don't really know the answer. Most classicists would say that it's very unlikely that there was a single person named Homer who created these things out of the top of his head. Most of the stuff that we get from these stories suggests that they're composed from lots of different little mini stories that then eventually get put together over time. Now, when they're composed, we do have a couple hints about that. So we see some of the things in the story like uh, the boar's tusk helmet, recall the Bronze Age. These things only exist in the Bronze Age. This one was found at Mycenae here. And this is, it seems to be the period that Homer's shooting for when he sets the scene in these stories. He's trying to recreate the Bronze Age world. 
but we have a hint that he's writing or that these stories are being composed during the 8th century. And that's because he has these little giveaways of things that are occurring um, that only happen in the 8th century. So for one, like cremating bodies. That only that doesn't happen in the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, you bury the dead. During the, the 8th century, you cremate bodies. And that happens sometimes in the story. So it's a part of his kind of like local culture, right? His immediate culture that's leaking into this story that he's trying to set hundreds of years earlier. Now, we do think that many of the poets, or the one poet, depending on whichever the case is, uh, came from the region of Ionia, which is in western Turkey here. And we think that for a couple reasons. One is that the dialect that we get in the story is more Ionian than it is kind of mainland Greek over here. All right? And also, when he starts referencing geography, his geographic knowledge of this place is really, really good, and geography of over here not so good. So we think it's kind of set in that area. Now this is one of the big ones. Did he write or did he sing? And one of the, the kind of questions that, um, that well, this is one of the questions that's kind of permeated these Homeric questions since they began. And it's a guy by the name of um, Milman Perry who gives us our best evidence for this. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more a little bit more about that in a second, but here's the dilemma, right? The oldest text that we've got, and really the only oldest reference to a written text, comes from the 500s, even though we think this thing was composed in the 700s. But then you think about it, and you're like, how do you sing a book that's 500 pages long? And so this is a difficult, difficult question. And this is the question we're going to start Friday by talking a little bit about how uh, classicists and anthropologists have looked at this and used modern cultures to figure this out about the ancient world. So that's what we're going to start with on Friday. Until then, go ahead and uh, make sure that you do read your excerpt from Homer, do your reading response, for module four, start thinking about the research proposal, and uh, have a wonderful couple days until I see you guys again on Friday. You guys are out of here for today. Have a great couple days, and I will see you then. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a good one.